and I'm here because I have a right to be here. My duty. If I've come home, I have a duty. What do you do when you go to your mother's house? Rastafari manifested out of the Pan-African movement, so Africa has exceeded my expectation. Mm -hmm. So this notion of community has to be revisited. I'm not the Rastafari community. I am African. If we're Africans, we're Africans. <laughs>
to find Rastafari and live Rastafari in the 1970s coming from certain homes was just the worst thing mm -hmm. in the world that could ever happen, you know? But nonetheless, um, yeah, in my evolution, this happened in the United States and it was my way of psychologically, physically, socially, politically responding to these elements of racialism um, that I experienced in the United States. Okay. Um, did your imagination when you were out there in the States or in Jamaica, what you heard about Ethiopia, meet somehow the reality on the ground here in Ethiopia? You know, it's interesting, but, and, and maybe now, and maybe it was naive of me, but I never had expectations based on what was said in media or other people's experience. I never had that. I knew I was returning home. And that's all that mattered to me. That's all that I was thinking about was my return home. And much like when I was taken away, generations ago and that memory still lives with me because it's not just something we read about in the history books the transatlantic slave trade it happened it's your family history like you could talk about your great 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 grandfather right well my great 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 grandmother survived the transatlantic slave trade and so this notion of returning home is less about for me um, what I'm necessarily coming into in terms of you know, will I have a job, or will the people welcome me, or will this? And it's more about my fi me finding my space and my place within my return, which is just a natural, it's a natural state, you know? Um, the second part of the question, how I would answer that is, has it met expectations? Again, my expectation was just to be home, to live in Africa my personal expectation and reconciling that with my most high, my liberty, my faith in Rastafari that he would protect, preserve and provide if I did my part. So Africa has exceeded my expectation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
this this notion um, in terms of the professional capacity because I'm a, a jurist by training, my education, I have a jurist doctorate from the University of Florida. So my training is in law. I also have a bachelor's in business, so I'm very much, you know, on, on that side as well. Um, but working here as a consultant and using my education, my experience and my exposure, even my 30 odd years doing artist management with the top artists like Rita Marley and Augustus Pablo and Sonia Coulson from Nigeria, all these artists and all this um, exposure has allowed me to help build even the capacity of those that I work with here. So whether it's an intern that works with us for three months or whether it's an employee that works for six months or one year, the ability to share and hopefully build the capacity, understanding or overstanding that everything that we contribute, that one one cocoa to fold the basket mm -hmm. is an additional arrow, you know, um, in the quiver for Africa in terms of building itself. Again, it makes it worth it because this is my duty. You know, this is my duty. If I've come home, I have a duty. What do you do when you go to your mother's house? You know, and you know, mommy's maybe tired or, you know, dad is really tired or whatever, and you see something have to be cleaned up, you don't complain, oh, why didn't you sweep today, mommy? Why didn't you? Did no, you do what you can, because you've come home with this energy and this capacity to do it. You do what you can. So this is one of the things that we've tried to do with our business, DYMDC and Associates, which is basically my name, Destination Mabet Megu Development Consultancy. We're a creative consulting firm. We work with um, UNICEF, UN agencies, with the AU, with private sector, with governments, with artists, all with one goal in mind. How do we develop Africa with an emphasis on the arts? because the artistic component is very critical to how we understand and how we see things. It's not the typical way. So whether you're in the political realm, industry, um, the technology field or whatever, looking at it from a creative lens, which is actually indigenous to Africans, because this is what we've always done. We've never been people in a box. When you look at the inventions, whether it's the pyramid, whether it's the Dogon people who are doing astronomy, you know what I'm saying? Timbuktu. I mean, this is this is who we are, creative, and it, so so this is what I'm trying to do with our company to the point that our motto is developing Africa through the arts. So, although yes, it's about that creation, whether that painting or that song or that poem, it's about the process because the process is a process of critical thinking. The process is a process of analysis. The process is a process of composition, content. So this is what we're trying to do, you know, with our clients, getting them to think, think out of the box. Okay, so I want to take you back to Ghana. You know, interestingly, my proposal was originally to compare the Rastafari community both in Ethiopia and in Ghana. Mm -hmm. uh, both, you know, both countries led by these Pan-African leaders, mm -hmm. Nkrumah mm -hmm. and uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, both the founding fathers of the Organization of African Unity. But I feel like the way the community is treated differently mm -hmm. for those who pre-patriated, as mm -hmm. you always say. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell me your experience. I know that uh, mm -hmm. I, I've gotten information for, for all the work you have done. You you are awarded the passport yes. of citizenship. Ghana, citizenship yes. of and Ghana, so you're exactly. Ghanaian as well. <laughs> yes. uh, tell us your experience as, as, a, as a Rasta woman, both in yes. Ghana and in Ethiopia. Absolutely. And, and again, you know, I've worked very, very hard to serve Africa, to serve Ghana, to serve Ethiopia, and the people of those countries through various projects, various initiatives. And so it, it, that's what gets rewarded. You know, I'm not the type that is going in and asking, I want this, I want that, I want the other. Um, I may ask, what can I do? Mm -hmm. I want to do, I want to do. And so based on that, 
very frankly speaking, the relationship from government to grassroots has been very, very positive, has been um, prosperous in the sense that we've been able to impact people's lives, whether it's doing um, programs for the elderly or for the youth or microfinancing or, you know, as we've done with the Rita Marley Foundation in Ghana, um, farming projects or digging a borehole or building schools for young people, roads, this sort of thing. So my personal experience has been quite positive, you know, and certainly I think that's been reflected here in, in Ethiopia, um, likewise, in terms of the carte blanche that we've been afforded. You know, I would not have been able to have done Rastafari the Majesty and the Movement exhibition at the National Museum. <laughs> Using things from the National Archive with the Ministry of Culture on Mbrahali Selassie. If it had not been for that level of trust that has been bestowed in us based on, again, our years of commitment and the way we do things. You know, now you use a term, if, if I could take a little license here, you use a term community. Mm -hmm. And many times, even though I too may use that, I'm uncomfortable with it because we did not come home. Let me speak for myself and those that have been taught, because I'm old school, you know, I came up in the 70s. My mentors were founders of the movement. Mm -hmm. You know, like Rasbona G's, who established the Nyabingi Order. Um, Mortimer Plana, who came here and who met the Majesty on the foot, the, the steps of the plane when he visited Jamaica. These were my teachers mm -hmm. in the movement. And our orientation was what we call black supremacy. And black supremacy was construed and contextualized to us not about superiority, mm -hmm. never, 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 mm -hmm. but about, one, the equality of humanity, mm -hmm. recognizing the origin of humanity. So what it does, it flips the discourse on, it, on its head that black people and Africans are sub, right? We're sub-Sahara, subservian, sub being below. Mm -hmm. It flips that narrative on its head recontextualize it around supreme mm. supreme original when we think of indinknesh when we think of the again the origins of humanity and where civilization flew right it, it grew from the continent and it spread throughout the universe yeah and so this is what that notion of black supremacy was now what does that mean in real terms, practical terms? It means that we identify with our continent and with ourselves beyond even a matter of hair and, and, and what we wear and so forth. That's the first level of that repatriation, recognition, departing from a Eurocentric perception of who we are. With that said, this is the reason why we returned home. Rastafari has been our spiritual compass, right? Our spiritual compass. But now, in this 21st century, where we have Rastafarians from China, and Japan, and Russia, and Ireland, and so forth, who have found this spiritual compass, that's one part of the narrative. The other part is our genetic memory and our right of return. We were taken away forcibly through the transatlantic slave trade and we've always wanted to come home. We've always yearned to return home. And so our return home is based on fulfilling and completing that, that horrible scar on humanity that has yet to reconcile what we have been through and who is we it's not just me all right we're talking about 75 percent of the best of africa that was taken away during a couple 
centuries through the transatlantic slave trade. The best minds, the best bodies, the most fertile. It was ripped from Africa and taken out. Now we want to come home and basically, and this is something that I even did, I remember going to the Cape Coast castles with my passport and my um, citizenship paper where I was sworn in in hand and my son photographed me in front of what was called the door of no return because they had the nerve to put that space there and say this is the door of no return when you go out you're not coming back in and we said no 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 we have returned we shall return <laughs> So, when we speak of community, this is a term that we've used in the West because this is what we had to do to survive as what was known as the peculiar people. We ate different, we looked different, we think different, we talked different, we dressed different. Just everything was so different to the point that, the point that um, we really did we lost ourselves. Coming home is part of that restoration, that redemption, you know? And so when we say community in the context of coming home, can you imagine again now you go back to your family's village, you know, you, your husband and your three, four children, whatever, come back to your family's village, your family, you can trace it, you know and you're called the community. It, it, it bothers me. I understand it. I definitely understand it. But I think we have to use different verbiage. There has to be a different narrative because I'm not the Rastafari community. I am African. And I'm here because I have a right to be here and because it's my home because I was ripped away. Nobody asked when they took my great, great, great grandmother. So would you like to go to Jamaica? Would you like to go to Cuba, America? What's your destination? Here's your visa. You know? Mm. But then to be realistic, I was there, I was in church, in church in my way, mm. and I interviewed people people like from uh, the indigenous people there and the one also uh, as we go I'm trying to correct myself with my terminology yes. and those who can hop okay yes. then I see I observe it or I sense it, this exclusion exactly on both sides Strong. and it, it's a, and it's two sides you know? absolutely the one who returned home excludes the indigenous exactly. and the indigenous excludes the others exactly and my during my the, my literature review my understanding was as i said it was out of sympathy okay like they came home but come on like that it doesn't feel like at home we are not treating exactly. them like they are one of us but we're not but acting as one because so we've said we're a community there is ignorance on both yes. sides Ex explain yes. this for yes, me yes yes yeah. again and when we have explanations, they're not justifications. I think that's really important for us to understand in terms of diagnosing, you know? And I have to go back. People will say it's in the past, but what happened to us hundreds of years ago with the transatlantic slave trade, followed by neocolonialism, apartheid, reconstruction, you name it, any of these racialism models that have been used throughout the year to divide, conquer, and gain wealth, because racialism is about wealth. Um, they've affected us so deeply. When you talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, we have it. And it's not just us that we're taking away. Here on the continent, we have it very much too. Very much too. Um, the sad thing is that we don't do well in analyzing mental issues right when someone is not well in the mind we either dismiss it or we lock them up 
The post-traumatic stress disorder that I'm speaking about is deep, it's entrenched, and it's intergenerational. And this is why the call for reparations is so critical. Because without a system, without the resources to repair, because that's what reparations is, to try to repair, it's not to repay, because you can never repay. How much is one life worth that was taken away? We don't measure life by money. But in terms of what we've been through and the harm that it's done to us psychologically, that even when we return to the continent, we still can't reconcile and say, ah, we're just Ethiopian or Ghanaian or African. We have to say we're the Rastafarian community. To me, it's a telltale sign. We're still holding on to this one thing that protected us out there because it was this sense of community that protected us in Brooklyn, in Brixton, in Kingston, Barbados, on and on. So when do we switch gears? When do we come out of that protectionism zone of being this community it's insulated i know my neighbor i know she speaks what i speak she eats what i eat he does what i do that's safe it's a safe space when do we open ourselves up and trust that this safe space goes beyond this notion of the ten of us that look alike and it expands to this country and this continent just as we've talked about for decades because if you read any analysis any research any writings listen to any songs that we have sung as Rasta for decades right decades even our Naya Bingi chant we want go home right home home so how do we then just say community and reconcile that with home because those are two different notions two different notions and so frankly speaking I think it's on us it's on us I cannot speak for my beloved African community whether it's Ethiopian or Ghana or whatever um, because they've got their own vestiges of colonialism that they're grappling with mm -hmm. but if we can do more as Rastafari, if we can do more when we come home to open our hearts, our minds, you know, to this country and to the continent that has allowed us to come. Because many, many here, they don't even have legal status for decades. And the government knows. Mm -hmm. But they've never gone in and scooped and deported. Never, ever, ever, ever has there been a deportment sweep like what you find in the United States with the Mexicans, right? And other places where they do sweeps. In France, right? Senegalese community, Franco sweep. If I'm wrong, I'd like someone to share that with me, but in the 12 years and in previous, I don't know of any deportment sweep that the government of Ghana, Ethiopia, South Africa, Kenya has done to deport us those who are here without the, the legal status. So this notion of community has to be revisited. I think it's something we have to take out of our vocabulary at some point and decide if we're Africans, we're Africans. If we're Ethiopians, we're Ethiopian. His Majesty said religion is personal. So whether you're Rastafari, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Orthodox, whether you're whatever it may be, Buddhist, whomever, your claim to this continent is based on your lineage. It's your lineage. This is why we're here. You know? This is where the, the road map has led us home. Right. about the cultural expression uh, of the ritualness. Mm -hmm. It's okay again, you know, I, I, as, as I go, I, I, I am more observing how it contradicts. It's an African thing, but then again, we look at okay, as if it's only it belongs to that. Yes. 
those people who come home, you know? Exactly. Were there any challenges that you have experienced because of that? Mm. It could be absolutely dreadlock, or absolutely. having dreadlock, or it could be for the attire, it could be for your dietary, for that matter. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, no, the Ganja sacraments. Yeah, and here is the irony <laughs> all these things are indigenous to Africa. Sangoma in South Africa, the spiritual women, they wear the locks. Bahatawi, mm -hmm. this is all indigenous. Ganja is a plant that grows everywhere. Mm -hmm. Rastas didn't invent it. The ability to eat. We have Tsong. Ethiopian Orthodox fast half of the year. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So these are not foreign things that Rastafari is bringing. But again, I have to go back. I can never deny or leave out the root, the history. So what we are in terms of Rastafari and Pan-Africans in the West for that matter, we're this amalgamation of all the African experiences that we could find to try to re-peace and rebuild our identity. Not only did they tell us we wouldn't return, they separated us by language, by tribe, by everything, right? After slavery. Then they said you can't get married. It was illegal to get married. So they broke down our social structures, right? You're not allowed to read, right? I mean, where you can get, if you try to escape, they may torture you and cut your foot or something. Mm -hmm. If you were found trying to read, it was death, you know? So after going through all these experiences where your name, your language, your food, even that African-Americans have this diet of the pork, it's like the intestines and the ears and the, 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 the foot and the tail and all these things that people, they discarded, right? But the slave master, after he ate his best part, or supposedly of the pig, throw the snow, and what did they do? They found a way to make that into their delicacy. They found a way to make this into food that they could survive on so hundreds of years later things like pig foot and these things and ox tail and so forth are eaten widely by black folks in the Americas I'm giving you that to say again what Africans have been able to do in the West with their resilience with their resilience is what they say take lemons and make lemonade They've been able to have the greatest African ingenuity. I mean, whether through musical expressions, again, the clothing, everything. It's the ability, even the language, even slang phrases and certain things. It is the desire of a people to redefine themselves. It's the desire of a people to recognize this heritage, whatever this heritage is, whether it's Kente from Ghana and the Injera from Ethiopia and um, the, the Goman or whatever from South Africa. And, the, you know, we're just pulling wherever we can find it. Oh, that, and building this whole new <laughs> you. amalgamated, you know? Um, African identity that's not based on a particular language group, tribal group, or what have you. So it's a new identity. This ironic new, new tribe, if you will. And it goes beyond Rasta, as I'm saying, because it's Pan-African. You have many Africans, like today is the last day, right, of Kwanzaa, mm -hmm. you know? And so people are celebrating that, that heritage regardless of what their faith is, you know? So, yes, it's off-putting to some because they don't understand it. You know, if it was just one thing, it would be fine. Just your clothes, okay, they can, but it's everything, it's the whole package. 
So that means we just need to communicate more. We need to spend time, and this is why we can't separate ourselves. Because the more we spend time together, the more we get to understand each other. Mm -hmm. And it's not about agreeing with everything. Mm -hmm. It's about overstanding. And also, it's recognizing that what we have been through is what has caused us to now recreate this identity that has manifested itself in this manner and specific to, to Rastafara. Let's talk about Pan Africa, Pan African movement and Rastafari movement. For me, this goes hand in hand. Yes. And I think Rastafari movement is the closest or realistic movement to make happen the Pan African movement. What, which one comes first? Or I Pan just African, mix it? <laughs> Pan African movement, definitely. You know, the Rastafari movement um, emerged in the late 1920s, you know? Um, and, and certainly the Battle of Adwa, um, one could arguably say has triggered mm. some of the thoughts that eventually um, realized this movement like by the 1920s and then confirmed in 1930 with the Empress coronation. But the Pan-African movement has existed formally, formally we can say, from the 1800s. You know, we've got writers, we've got people who were documenting this, we've got um, movements to try to bring us home, the establishment of Liberia, you know? So certainly, you know, I'd be foolhardy to say Rastafari came first because that's not the process. Um, Rastafari, in my experience, observation, and overstanding, man Rastafari manifested out of the Pan-African movement in terms of a desire to have a spiritual component, one, a focal point, two, being the majesty, and three, a complete holistic way of life within which to attain basically the same goals as the Pan-Africanist, which is the restoration of the continent, the mm -hmm. good, everything that's good that we want to happen on the continent, including the abolishment of colonialism, neocolonialism, and, and that thought process, those philosophies. Pan-African movement, I, I think one also could say arguably that Pan-African movement is pretty much in the center of the Rastafari movement. And that's actually what uh, triggered, it, it just happened to be the Rastas are at the forefront, those who return at home and who, who, who replied to that call by the emperor. Uh, but then when we come to... Like, is there a color? Some say that Rast Rastafari is a new, it's a new race because it includes the Chinese, uh, the white people, and everyone. Can we say that, it, does it have a color when we see those things together, Pan-African and Rastafari? Well, you know, the concern that I have is that the mandate or the guiding principles of the movement and again, what is the Rastafari movement in the Pan-African context? It was a holistic spiritual movement to help empower, uplift, and restore the African identity, right? Mm -hmm. The principles were redemption, liberation, and repatriation. And by the 1980s, we added reparations to that. This is the movement, and that's what the movement is, should be, and has to continue to be. Now, within this holistic rubric, if you will, hmm. there is a spiritual component, and that is, who do I pray to? Who is my redeemer? Who is the one that gives me my light, my strength, my source, right? And this is not anything new. Throughout the world, everybody has different spiritual references. Now, and certainly I would say, you know, reggae music has added to this. Um, by the 1990s, 
late 80s, 50 years after the advent of the movement, we see Europeans, we see Chinese, we see Japanese who say they see Emperor Haile Selassie as God Almighty too, and so they arrest us. I can't say anything about that. How do I tell the South African that he can't be Buddhist? Mm -hmm. How do I tell the Russian that, you know, he can't be Hindu? How do I, you know, again, as Majesty says, religion is personal. Just to use the term religion. We mm -hmm. know that Rastafari is a way of life because it's holistic. Mm -hmm. But that spiritual part, you know, whatever an individual does and, and finds that light, you know, that's fine. But in the context of the Rastafari movement, if you are not committed to those principles, redemption, liberation, repatriation, and reparations, and are not actively, whether in a small way or in a large way, working towards that, then to me it's questionable, you know, your commitment then to this totality of Rastafari because we can't segment it out. We can't say, okay, the spiritual part, that's it. Da, 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 mm -hmm. You know, it's a holistic. And again, that was the purpose. This is how it evolved because Pan-Africanism in the beginning, it did and it had allies from all walks of life, mm -hmm. you know, and the founders were not Rasta. Mm -hmm. So it does concern me and I see more and more where, um, non-Africans are embracing this spirituality but there's a money trail mm -hmm. every one of them that I know has a money trail when I say a money trail they're all involved in some business or another that's related to the Rastafari philosophy whether it's icons culture mm -hmm. whatever and I'm not sure how much of that is really helping the movement. But I do not know one non-African Rastafari that is not engaged in some type of business. Mm. So, the ninja. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Given from the time that the emperor has uh, made this call, in the 1940s or 47 mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. to be exact mm -hmm. many decades have passed and mm -hmm. still the number of the returns mm -hmm. is small sure why is that well many of us who have returned home did not come prepared very frankly mm -hmm. we you know as the Bible said we walk by faith and not by sight and so um, that's very important and we'll never lose never lose that because we're faithful people mm -hmm. we are faithful people but the Bible has another parable if you will it says faith without works is death mm -hmm. right so the most high has his part faith has a part but we have another part that's the work and so I think Many have come, probably 10 times who you see there in Cheshimani have, have, have come, but it's painful. It's painful for men who come with their children, they give up everything, they say they're going home, and then when they get there, because they weren't prepared, or if they were prepared, it wasn't an environment that allowed them to prosper, and they've left. Um, anecdotal statistics show it's like one out of 10 that stays. One out of 10. Mm -hmm. You know, and so lack of preparation one, two, lack of institutions that allow us to flourish, three, this notion of community has become a two edged sword because while it worked in the West to keep us together and protect us, it is a divisive factor here on the continent. You know, four, Again, I go back to the post-traumatic stress disorder that we are not prepared psychologically. And we know there's fight or flight, hmm. you know? And so this is what's happening with us. You know, we're ending up either just fighting against and fire burning 
everything that's not what we have in our little sephir, you know, or we run away because we're still humans, right? And you want to protect yourself. Mm. So this is what's happening. Now, I should say this because there are success stories and although the success stories may be the minority, I would like us to focus on those who have made it. And when I say made it, I mean they're still here and they're healthy and they're happy. And there are many stories like that. In Shashamani, Addis Ababa, Bahadar, the continent of Africa. And I would like to see more platforms where we're talking about these things because maybe this is the change that we need for people to see who is doing well. And as I said, wealth is healthiness and happiness. Some may say it's the income they make or the house they live in or whatever, but it's that health and that happiness factor, right? So if we show more of these positive stories and examples, I think this is a part to transform the relationship internally and externally. Internally meaning those who are also going to come and externally, because we've set up this community, them, us, externally, the community, right? The country, the mm. continent, mm. outside these 50 people mm -hmm. <laughs> who've come in. What are their stories? What are their narratives? Mm. You know, a person like Sister Joanne, that's been in Shashamani forever. All her children are born there. And it, it, it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. But her her story is incredible to see now a third generation. Her grandbabies are there. They've got their business. I mean, we've got some success stories. And we have to speak about that. Uh, as you have rightly pointed out in the beginning, my topic the research topic is talks about the challenge that the returns face and uh, of course that's not what i got <laughs> here from our discussion but you're not the only one many of my informants from the returnees happens to focus on the endurance and it's not that there's no challenge and they don't deny that yeah but they just keep on saying, like, uh, as much as I, I, I try to dig the challenge yeah. and pull a trade, they tell me, you know, this is the same challenge that we face outside. Thank you. That's the point. But That's the point. I have a Juris Doctorate. I was in one of the most prestigious public institutions in the United States of America, the, United, the University of Florida, mm -hmm. the law school, okay? I mean, what more? You got the job, the 401k, you've got the office, you've got... It was so challenging. It was so painful to be in an institution with that history of racism and, and, and the way you're seen almost, am I a token, am I the flavor of the month, am I... You know, you're constantly... So everywhere in life there's challenges. Mm -hmm. Everywhere in life. But the spirit of Rastafari, the spirit of, of, of the universe, because I think this is a... A, a, a feature within all faiths, all spirituality, right? That you're looking for that light. If it means walking through that darkness to get to that light, you're focused on the light. And this is an important narrative that we cannot escape because as your other informants have said, there's challenges everywhere. Every single day, every moment, from when you wake up in the morning. But, but then for four decades, three decades, two decades, not being able to work. Mm -hmm. And not, you know... Like we had that in the West. In Jamaica, and even now, there's certain schools where children with dreadlocks cannot go to school. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. In Europe, in America, those challenges are there. So what's the difference? At least you're home. At least you're home. And for us, that connection to the ground, to the earth, to a space where you can exhale <laughs> amidst the challenges is everything. So basically, if, if you're asking, okay, do you prefer the challenges, or do you prefer to go through your challenges here, or would you like to go through them in New York? <laughs> That's the question that you're asking.
Hmm. Because there's going to be challenges. Again, as a dreadlocks, you know, how many pilots are there? How many surgeons? We have them now, but they've bankers. had to fight. But they've had to fight hmm. to rise only because they don't come near here. Right? Because we're not asking other bankers or pilots about their, their philosophy. Are you Muslim and what do you think about Islam and what do you think? We're not asking, what do you think about the Catholic Church? We're not asking those questions. We're only asking that of Rasta, triggered by the here and dare I say, by the hatred and ignorance in our heart about Ethiopia, about the majesty, about our legacy, and about the continent in general self-hate self-hate is a big part of what we're experiencing on both sides but this was a vestige of again slavery and colonialism it taught us to not love our hair it taught us to not love our nose it taught us to not love our skin because all these things were bad even this term, sub-Saharan Africa, who came up with that? Sub? Is there a sub-America? A sub? Where do we use these terminologies? Third world. Mm. Where's the second? Bloody. I just skipped a whole section and just... <laughs> <laughs> Drop it down, <laughs> you know. So again, the question to me of these challenges is more, as I said, do I prefer to face the challenges in New York or do I prefer to face them here in, in Addis Ababa? And and I say, I say Addis, I say Accra, I say Johannesburg, I say Nairobi. <laughs> so given all this, would you still? Call Africa or specifically Ethiopia home, and this will be the journey that you invite your grandchildren to come and face whatever is going here. Oh, yeah, and, and my grandson, um, Dawit, my first grandson, has already been here, he's been here twice. All ten of my children they come back and forth. Um, they were raised in the consciousness, they were raised knowing that they were Africans. They all have. Ethiopian names and this is part of their their DNA and their genetic memory that I've helped to you know um, stimulate because we all have it in us right if it's genetic yeah um, so for me the greatest thing and what we're, we're building here yes is a place that my children will be able to come to my grandchildren and one day if not even living here under the principles of Sankofa, which is an Endinkra symbol, it's that swan looking over its shoulder. You know, the Sankofa. Don't forget to look back. Don't forget to look at your history. So even if they all don't come and live here, the fact that they're coming, that they're connecting, that it's part of their consciousness, it's part of their reality, then that to me is victory. Because wherever you are, you have to know who you are. And maybe it's an oxymoron, maybe it sounds ridiculous, but identity matters as much as it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Identity matters as much as it doesn't matter. You know, it's all in context. But for a youth, you know, in the United States, to know that he is connected to something bigger, connected to a lineage and, and people that look like him, feel like him, that he's never seen before, to me is a very powerful, powerful narrative. When youth in the United States, in Europe, black youth are killed for being black, right? Driving while black is a crime, going to school while black, walking down the wrong block while black, shopping while black, you go in a store, you followed all these things. So when a youth, when a child knows 
there is another space because space matters there's mm. another space another place where i can go whether once a year twice a year even online and look at certain things and connect to me that's part of healing this post-traumatic stress disorder it is a step Modesta, thank you very much for your time. It was really a pleasure. Oh, really? Lightly. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Always. Oh, you're most welcome. Mm. I know it's a different mm. point of view. <laughs> we can go all day. I know, you know I know, I know. <laughs>